I lead chapel at our preschool every week, and it's amazing how quickly kids pick up things, right? Uh, school year started. Two weeks in, I met a mom, and she said, yeah, I picked up my daughter. She just started here. We were driving home. She's in the back seat in her car seat. She starts singing, holy, holy, holy. Two weeks in, three-year-old. Last year, I, I met a mom down at the preschool, and uh, she said, oh, my son has told me about you. My son has told me that, that he does chapel with the holy man. <laughs> he, he refers to you as the holy man. Do you call yourself the holy man? <laughs> and, and I told her, no, I, I don't call myself that. It's just what I prefer others to call me. <laughs> well, actually, I said, I, no, I don't know why he calls me the holy man, but I'll take it. Now, we're, we're in a series right now on the life and faith of John Wesley. And when we left off Wesley's story last week, folks were calling him the holy man. Well, sort of. Wesley was part of a small group at Oxford University, which others referred to as the holy club. And others referred to them as the holy club because they were so passionate in their pursuit of holiness. They were so passionate, so disciplined, so methodical that others began calling them Methodists. Now, on the one hand, this pursuit of holiness is a great thing. As I shared last week, I've been praying that God would give me a greater hunger and desire for holiness. But there's a danger in this pursuit. If it's done without an understanding of God's grace, God's unmerited love and acceptance, then it can lead to trouble. Now, I'm basing this series on a number of sermons by Pastor Adam Hamilton. And as he points out, if we pursue holiness without understanding grace, we end up thinking, I've got to try harder and harder to please God. I've got to do more and more to make God love me. And that's what happened to John Wesley. He started out on the right path, but, but this pursuit of holiness became almost an obsession. Have I done enough? H have I done enough? I I'm not sure. If I, if I just do more, then I'll know for sure that God really loves and accepts me. Wesley was trying to earn his salvation, and he's not the first person to do this. Take the Apostle Paul. Paul, who was formerly named Saul, was, was a Pharisee. A and the Pharisees were known for their pursuit of holiness. They wanted the people of their day to obey God's law, and Paul was zealous in his desire for obedience. There are 613 laws in the Bible, and the Pharisees came up with around 10 more laws for every law in the Bible. More laws to make sure they were really following the Bible laws correctly. So Paul was trying to obey around 6,000 laws. He was doing a lot for God, yet he wasn't experiencing peace with God. But then Paul heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that changed everything. In the gospel... Paul discovered that salvation isn't something we earn, but is a gift that we receive through Jesus Christ. Notice how Paul puts this in Romans 5. He writes that while we were still sinners and powerless to do anything about that, Christ died for us. And through Christ's death, we were justified, made right with God, already happened. Through Christ's death, we were reconciled to God. Already happened. Through Christ's death, we were forgiven. Already happened. And, and the fact that Christ died for us while we were still sinners demonstrates God's great love for us. We don't have to earn that love. In, in fact, we can't. God already accepts us. God already loves us. We don't have to work for that. We don't have to strive for that. We don't have to try harder to earn that. It is a gift given to us in Jesus Christ. A gift to be received by faith. And once we experience this gift 
by faith we have peace with God. Peace with God. That's what Paul, that's what Paul finally experiences through the grace of Jesus Christ. Peace with God. And that's what Martin Luther experienced. Martin Luther was a monk who lived 200 years before Wesley. And like Paul, Luther spent much of his life trying to do all that he could to earn God's favor. Now in his head, he probably knew, yeah, God loves me, but not in his heart. In his heart, he didn't feel that. In his heart, he thought, I've got to do more. I've got to try harder. I've got to stand out from the crowd. And if I do, then maybe finally God will, will truly accept me. Maybe then, finally, I'll truly be worthy of God's love. Luther pursued holiness without understanding grace. And where did that land him? He ended up sleeping naked on the cold stone floor of the monastery. Thinking that such a, a great sacrifice would endear him to God. Like Paul, Luther thought, I've got to work hard to earn God's love. A while back, I was listening to the radio, and there was a program about 9-11. And there was a man who was being interviewed, and his, his wife had died on 9-11. And at one point during the interview, he mentioned how his wife was in heaven. And then, and then he said this. He said, so now my aim in life is to do enough good, to be good enough that I can go to heaven when I die and see her there. And I was driving when I heard this and I stopped the car and, and, and I wrote that down because those words really were, were striking to me. In essence, he's saying, if I can do good things in life, if I try my hardest to be a good person, then I will have done enough to get my way into heaven. That was the kind of mindset that Wesley had during his time at Oxford, trying to do enough in order to be in good standing with God. So as we mentioned last week, he limited his haircuts so that he could give the money to the poor. He fasted two times a week. He woke up every day at 5 a.m. to pray. He received communion every Sunday, but eventually that wasn't enough, so he began receiving communion every day of the week. He served those in need. In fact, he had a daily schedule. You know, Monday, visit those in prison. Tuesday, visit the elderly, etc. He was doing so much to please God. To win God's favor so much. But here's the problem with that. If your faith is built on doing enough to get God to love you, then you are missing out on the most important teaching of the Christian faith, which is God's grace. That being saved, being made right with God is a gift you receive, not something you earn. A gift given to you through Jesus Christ and what he did for you on the cross. Many of us know this in our head, but, but we don't know it. We don't truly get it in our heart. Ultimately, for John Wesley, it took a crisis of faith for him to realize, I can never do enough to earn God's acceptance. Here's how this, this crisis came about. In 1732, James Oglethorpe, who was a member of British Parliament, came up with the idea of forming a new colony in America. He had proposed this idea to the king, whose name was George, and said, hey, we'll name this new colony after you. Hence, the start of Georgia. So Oglethorpe, he came to the, to the U.S., he uh, became governor of Georgia and started the town of Savannah. Then he came back to England and he was looking for a missionary who could come and serve in this new setting, who could be a pastor to the new colony and reach out to the Native Americans. And Oglethorpe spoke to Wesley about this idea and Wesley said, yes, I'll go. Now, prior to leaving for Georgia, Wesley wrote this in his journal about why he was going. He wrote, My chief motive is the hope of saving my own soul. 
He was still seeking to save his own soul. Wesley was still questioning his own salvation and hoping that, that a sacrifice this great would finally bring him the assurance he lacked. So on October 14th, 1735, Wesley set sail for Georgia. Here's a picture of the ship he went on. That's right. Wesley sailed to Georgia on the Hokulea. No, okay, I'm just making sure you all are awake. All right. So here's a replica of the ship that Wesley would have sailed on to America. That's a three and a half month journey. Kind of long, right? Three and a half months on this ship to get to America. So in February, Wesley finally landed in America. And I want to show you a couple of sites that you can see. How many of you have been to Georgia? Savannah? Oh, wow. Okay. So um, there is a, a marker there um, that has a cross on it. And I know it's hard for you to read, but this is on Cockspur Island, which is on the way into Savannah. And it says right there, John Wesley landed in America on this island February 6th, 1736. And then if you go into Savannah, there's also a, a sign there that says John Wesley's American Parish. You'll find this in Savannah. Uh, commemorating that this was Wesley's time in America was spent in Savannah. You'll also find a statue of John Wesley uh, in historic Reynolds Square in Savannah that, that was put up uh, in memory of John Wesley and his time spent there. So Wesley was in, in a new land, but all was not well with his soul. And I'd like to mention three triggers that led to a, a crisis of faith for Wesley. First, during the ride over, there are all these storms that hit. As you can imagine, three and a half months crossing the Atlantic Ocean. And there's one storm that was a massive storm. The main mast broke off during the storm. The main mast of the ship broke off and everyone knew we're going to die. So everyone is just, we're, we're going down, we're going to die. And Wesley gets really scared. He's terrified of dying. But there's a group of 26 Moravian Christians on the boat and as everyone is freaking out, we're going to die, they are singing hymns and totally at peace in the face of death. And Wesley is struck by their faith. Wesley starts to ask, what do they have that I don't? What do they understand that I don't? Starts to raise these questions for him. The next trigger is that the folks in Georgia reject Wesley's leadership. When they arrive, they had brought along these caskets of rum that were meant to, hey, have some rum when we celebrate, when we land safely, right? So when they get there, Wesley, being the good pastor that he is, says, uh-uh, we're not touching this rum. He makes them bring all the caskets of rum out, splits them open, and pours the rum out over the, on the ground. Not the way to win friends in your new neighborhood, <laughs> right? There are a lot of people that are not very happy about this. Then Wesley starts a daily 5 a.m. prayer. Now, the only folks I know who gather together for prayer each day at 5 are Koreans. So I don't know if there's any Koreans. I know Korean churches, they still do this. Early morning prayer, every day of the week. I don't know if there are any Koreans with him. But he starts early morning prayer at 5 a.m. Then Wesley says, unless you come to 5 a.m. prayer every day, you cannot receive communion on Sunday. Should we try that? <laughs> okay, also, not a popular move. The folks in Georgia do not like this John Wesley. In fact, Wesley in his journal, he records this interaction. A, a man in his congregation comes up to him and here's what the man says. I like nothing that you do. <laughs> Indeed. There is neither man nor woman in the entire town who abides a word you say. And so you may preach long enough, but nobody will come to hear you. That's a cheery note to, to receive from one of your parishioners. I like nothing that you do. So, but that, that's what you get when you become a Pharisee. When you forget about grace and demand that others keep doing more and more to measure up. So... 
Wesley has this fear he experiences on the ship right over, and then this rejection he experiences from the townspeople, and then third, the third trigger for crisis, heartbreak. Romance gone awry. Some things never change. So her name was Sophia Hopke, Miss Sophie, as Wesley called her. She was 17 years old, which at the time was typical age of marriage, and Wesley was 32, and her dad said, hey, you should mentor my daughter. Uh, spend time with her. He's really trying to just be a matchmaker. And Sophie was, in fact, already engaged, but her fiancé was in prison for forgery. So I'm thinking, she was like, you know, I chased a bad boy. Now let's go with Mr. Stable. Right? 32-year-old Anglican priest. Here we go. We're good. So they start hanging out, and it becomes romantic. But see, for Wesley... Being such, in such a pursuit of holiness, if you really want to be holy, you'll remain single. That was a, a value for Wesley. The more holy you are, holiness, real deal, you're going to be single. So even though they both had interest, Wesley never moved the relationship forward. Now Sophie at some point started dating another guy. And at one point, someone came up to John Wesley and said, Sophie is going to get married in three days unless you do something or say something. Now, Wesley is shocked. What? All he's got to do is tell her, I love you. That's it. He's just got to let her know. But he says nothing, and she gets married. And Wesley's devastated. He writes in his journal about how, how devastated he is. Now, after Sophie gets married, Wesley finds out that she'd been dating this guy for quite a while, and he's mad. Even though they weren't ever officially dating. You know, it's one of those things where we got something, but not really... So she writes him a letter and she says, you, she, he tells her, you were deceitful, you lied to me, and unless you, unless you repent publicly, you cannot receive communion. This is John Wesley, our founder. So <laughs> Sophie says, all right, we'll see about that. So she comes to church the next Sunday, time for communion. She makes her way down to receive communion from John Wesley. And what does John Wesley do? He refuses to serve her communion. Once again, not a popular move. In fact, her uncle files charges against Wesley for defamation of character, and Wesley is arrested and put in jail. Now, he gets out right away, but he has to wait for a trial. And meanwhile, you know, church attendance kind of drops. That, that tends to happen when your pastor gets thrown in jail. Like less people showing up on Sunday. Wesley kind of looks at what's going on, and Wesley realizes, this isn't going to end well for me. So Wesley takes off. He flees. Flees Georgia, hops on a ship, and set sails back to England. At this point in his life, how do you think Wesley is feeling? I've got a faith that doesn't stand up in the face of death. My parishioners have completely rejected me. My heart's been broken and I've been arrested. Wesley is feeling like a failure. A failure in life. But see, here's the, here's the cool thing. God takes our failures and rejections and uses them for our good if we allow it. If we don't throw in the towel, if we humble ourselves and, and look at what, what needs to change in us, God can take our worst failures and grow something new and beautiful out of them. My former uh, seminary professor used to say, God turns our stumbling blocks into stepping stones. God turns our stumbling blocks into stepping stones, and that's what God did for Wesley. You, know, you think about it. What if Wesley had been fine and dandy in Georgia? If Wesley had stayed in Georgia, he maybe would have had one church of very holy people. <laughs> who came to prayer at 5 a.m. every day in order to receive communion. And that might have been the end of the story. 
But because of his failure, God led Wesley into an experience of grace that launched a revival of grace out of which 40,000 Methodist churches were started in America. 40,000. When we trust God in the midst of failure, God can bring something beautiful out of that. Here's how God did that for Wesley. After traveling back to England, he spent about uh, four months in London, four months of questioning, searching, praying. And on, on May 24th, 1738, Wesley attended an afternoon service at St. Paul's Cathedral. And he was then invited to attend a meeting that night, a, a meeting of a religious society. And a religious society was like a disciple group, or even like AA, a group that, that came together regularly to help each other grow. And this society was a group of Moravian Christians. And they met on Aldersgate Street in London. Wesley didn't really want to go, but, but eventually he agreed to do so. So there's now a park in London where this gathering would have taken place. And they're not exactly sure of the location. But on this park, there's a sign that sits on the gate. And it commemorates what took place that night. And you can see this sign here. I just want to read the top part. It just says, this tablet is erected to the glory of God in commemoration of the evangelical conversion of the Reverend John Wesley, M.A., on May 24th, 1738. Now, across the street from this park is the Museum of London. And sitting outside the Museum of London is an artwork, a memorial called uh, the Aldersgate Flame. And that's actually a flame. Um, and that is sitting outside. That's the Museum of London. And on this flame are the words that John Wesley wrote um, about the experience that he had on this night. And you can see some of the words that are etched in this Aldersgate flame. Here's what happened. At the, at the meeting that Wesley went to, someone was reading Luther's commentary on the book of Romans, which was written by Paul. So here is Luther saying, I finally got what Paul finally got, which is salvation by faith through God's grace, not our efforts. And here are the words that Wesley wrote, which are inscribed on the Alders Gate flame. He says, In the evening, I went very unwillingly to a society in Alders Gate Street, where one was reading Luther's preface to the epistle to the Romans, about a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation, and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. Wesley writes, I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for my salvation. I don't have to work for my salvation, and I don't have to keep questioning if I'm okay with God. An assurance was given me, an assurance. I finally had peace with God. It went from my head to my heart. God loves me and accepts me, not because of what I've done, but because of what Christ has done. I stopped looking at myself. Have I done enough? Am I good enough? And I started looking at Christ instead. See, grace shifts my focus from me to Christ, from my worthiness to Christ's faithfulness, to what Christ accomplished on the cross. It's not about trying harder but living in joyful response to what Jesus Christ has done. On the cross, Jesus says to each of us, I love you. I love you so much, I died for you. I know your name. I know your issues. 
I know your sin and I still love you. I've already forgiven you. I've already shown you grace and mercy. Rest in my grace. Trust in my love. I love you and accept you. Do you understand that? That God loves you and accepts you. That you don't have to earn his favor. It is given to you through Jesus Christ. Our role is to receive this gift by faith and to live in it. To walk in God's grace and to be shaped by God's grace. This morning, God invites you to receive his gift of salvation. To trust in Christ. Christ alone for your salvation. And to receive an assurance that he has taken away your sins and saved you. Taken away my sins and saved me. Let's pray. I want to invite you as we turn to the time of prayer, if you're comfortable doing so, just to put your arms around yourself. Give yourself a hug. I want to invite you to close your eyes and just wrap your arms around your shoulders. And I want you just to imagine for a moment that these are God's arms wrapped around you. And I want you just to feel that, God's embrace. And I want you just to hear God saying to you, I love you. I know you completely and I love you. And I want to invite you just to take a minute to respond to God. Just to whisper under your own breath, just say to God, I accept your love. I receive your forgiveness. I trust that you've forgiven me. I trust that you love me. Help me to live in your grace. And God, I pray for each person here this morning as I pray for myself. that this truth we may know in our head would truly sink into our heart, that our hearts would be warmed by your Holy Spirit, strangely warmed, that we would understand in the depth of who we are that it's not about being worthy enough. It is about what you have already done for us. God, help us to receive your grace. Help us to know your love. And may we be changed by it. May it fill us with joy and peace and life. I now want to invite Pastor Samuel to come and continue us in a time of prayer as we pray for those around us.